Russ's talk, which is going to be about inferring mental states from fMRI. All right. Thanks very much. I'm actually veering a little bit from the talk that I promised uh, to focus on what I'm calling an open uh, ecosystem for neuroimaging meta-analysis that my colleagues and I have been working on for a number of years now. So first I want to talk about what open means to me when I use the word. Um, and it, I'm going to kind of use it to mean a couple of things. Um, can you reset the timer just so I'll know if I'm on time? It's, it's on zero right now. Um, the first is basically that it's the, the minimal possible restriction on usage of the data. So um, no requirements for, for co-authorship, no prior restraint on what you can do with the data or what kind of questions you can ask with the data. So when we give out data, we generally use, you know, it's really important that when you give out data that it has a, a formal license associated with it so people know both legally and ethically like what they can and can't do with those data. We generally use something called a, po a public domain dedication like the um, Creative Commons Zero License, which basically says we're putting this in the public domain. Anybody can do what they want with it. Now, obviously, if you're nice, you're going to cite us, but we're not going to sue you if you don't cite us. Um, so the other thing that open means to me is that I can, and anybody can get to the data in a programmatic way. So they don't have to have me send them a file. And you've already heard a little bit about this from Tao, that the data are accessible via... APIs over the web, right? So um, this is an example from the NeuroVault API. You saw uh, Tal mention the, uh, the NeuroSynth one. Um, and the idea is if you want to get all the images from NeuroVault, you can just uh, hit this API, this particular website, and you know, grab a bunch of information about any, all the metadata about any particular one, or you can just kind of you know, uh, pull them all down uh, sort of in, any, in whatever way you want. And you can build that into other software so that you can actually sort of you know, use them uh, in a seamless way. So, um, so the, this ecosystem that I am going to talk about sort of spans from you know, a lot of what you've already heard about today. And it, it's actually two of the, the three projects are ones that you've heard talks at least a little bit about um, that span this kind of space of what you might think of as breadth versus depth. right? So on the one hand, you have projects like Neurosynth and BrainMap that, um, that hold coordinates, so you can get a lot of data, you know, just go to papers, find the data, um, but they're not particularly deep, right? They don't give you all the information that you might want. On the other hand, you, you, can, you have databases like uh, uh, OpenFMRI, uh, which is now going to become Open Neuro, and I'll tell you a little bit about Open Neuro, which holds raw data, right? So now you can sort of take that and do r really kind of deep, analyses on it, but there's not that many data sets. You know, there's about 100 data sets in, in Open Neuro. And NeuroVault sits sort of in between, right, where there's a growing amount of data there and you can do a lot with it, but it's, you're still limited by whatever analyses the person did to begin with. So, um, so at the top left corner, you've already heard a lot from Tal about NeuroSynth and you know, you know what you can do with it. I just want to highlight what actually things that he already said. NeuroSynth is a completely open resource. All the data are released under a, an open license. The coders are released under a permissive license. He has a web API, has a Python package. So really, I think a great example of you know, what, when I talk about an open project, um, what I mean. You heard from Tom a good reasons why you know, image-based meta-analysis is an important thing to do. And, um, and you've actually, my, my, a good bit of my thunder has been stolen by the previous talks because they've already talked a lot about NeuroVault. Um, which is great. I think it's, you know, it's become a really important project for the community, and uh, Chris Gorliski, you know, deserves a lot of credit for, for making this happen. We talked for a number of years about the need for such a database, and he sort of came, came along and really made it happen in a way that makes it, you know, really uh, sort of easy to use. So you've seen maps like this, and I want to focus on the analyses that Tal sort of uh, alluded to but didn't really tell you about. So there's if you upload a data set to NeuroVault, then uh, there's a little button here that says analysis, and there's several things you can do with that. Um, and in part, you know, we did this to try to incentivize people to put data in. So we don't want you to just put data in because it's a good thing to do. We want you to put data in because it's actually going to be useful for you to do so. So the first thing you can do is a power analysis. So there's a tool called NeuroPower that Yoka Dernes, who was in my lab, uh, worked on, uh, which you could just go access at neuropowertools.org. Um, but if you have an image that's in uh, NeuroVault, then you can just with a few clicks get a power analysis that would tell you how many subjects would you need in order to have a particular level of power to reproduce that map. 
Um, and so it makes it really easy if somebody's uploaded something to say what, what would it take to, to replicate that study. Um, so that's the first thing you can get out of uh, NeuroVault. The second one is uh, this, what we call the similar image search. So there's now enough data in NeuroVault that you can you know, go see sort of what, what other maps look like yours. You, and this is particularly useful if, like, if you have a map where you, know, you, you, you want to know like, what's going on and you can't really tell, you can go see what other studies are finding maps that are sort of similar to mine. Um, and so this shows an example for an image from uh, Chris Gorilewski's verb generation task, what other particular data sets might have similar ones, uh, similar activation. <laughs> and you can actually plot it out at a kind of a region by region level and see sort of, you know, how, what particular regions might be driving this similarity. So it's a, again, it's an exploratory tool. You're probably not gonna go write a paper about it, but it could be really useful for kind of understanding what's going on in your data. Um, oh, did I skip over that? Uh, okay, so I, I, I skipped the, um, the little bit about the, the button for the gene expression atlas. But another thing you can do is actually decode from your data um, what patterns of gene expression are related to your data. And this is using the Allen Human Gene Expression Atlas. So the Allen Brain Institute basically took six human brains and did sort of whole brain, not whole brain, but across the brain, uh, gene expression analyses with a bunch of probes. Um, they've made these data available, mapped into a 3D space. And so now what we can do is say, um, you know, what particular genes have patterns of expression across the brain, across those six people, that look like your activation map? And this, again, could be useful if you're trying to understand particular biology of a, you know, of a thing that you're looking at. <laughs> Okay, and then another of the buttons is uh, this cognitive decoding button. And you've already heard a bit from Tal about the idea of cognitive decoding or what you might call reverse inference, um, where basically the idea is you have a map and you want to know what are the terms in NeuroSynth that are, would be associated with maps that look like yours. So this is a map for verb generation, basically people talking in the scanner. And we can go to uh, NeuroSynth and ask, you know, what are the terms that are close that that are associated with maps that look like that? And they are phonological, language, speech production, production. So, kind of gets it right, at least for you know for sort of obvious things. Now, Tal's already sort of highlighted the limitations of of NeuroSynth. So you have to. It's really, I think, again, useful for exploration, um, and you need to keep its limitations in mind. But nonetheless, it's a really powerful way to sort of you know quickly figure out what might be going on in a particular data set. Um, you've already seen from Tom the, um, the, the idea that you can use, you know, actually now with FSL as well, you can not exactly instantly from FSL, but you can share your data into NeuroVault pretty quickly from either SPM or FSL using this uh, NIDM export. Um, and so, uh, so it's becoming much easier to sort of get data into, uh, into NeuroVault. Now, you know, questions come up sometimes about are the data biased, right? Only certain people are going to put their data into NeuroVault. And, um, and I would actually argue that they're biased in a fortuitous way. Um, this is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, this work from Yelta Wickards, where they looked at the, basically they, they asked a bunch of people in psychology to share their data. And some people did and some people didn't. Then they went back and looked at the papers of the people who had shared data versus not shared data and found that people who'd been unwilling to share their data actually had more statistical errors in their papers than the people who'd been willing to share their data. Um, and so I think that to the degree that, you know, NeuroVault clearly is a, a small proportion of the literature, but I think it's a proportion of the literature potentially from some of the, the better work that's being done. I hope that's true. Um, NeuroVault ticks all the boxes for openness. Um, it, uh, has uh, data released under the CC0 license, open code, web API. We actually put all the data in the Stanford Digital Repository. So if NeuroVault goes away, the website might stop working, but all the maps will be there so that somebody else could actually take it and actually spin up. You, I mean, you could take the code and spin up a version of your own NeuroVault if you wanted to. <laughs> That's what openness means. Um, so then at the, at the bottom right of that, of the ecosystem plot, is the sharing of sort of complete raw data. And this, is, this was our entree into data sharing about, I guess, nine years ago now um, with the Open fMRI project. So the idea was to share complete raw fMRI data sets. Um, and we're now up to about 100 data sets, fully open sharing. You don't have to sign any forms or do anything. You just go grab the data and they're yours. 
Um, and they're released under a CC0 license, so you can do whatever you want with them. You don't have to ask us for permission or anything. Um, now, in the last year, we've transitioned to basically the next generation of open fMRI, which we call open neuro. And um, there's a couple of things about open neuro that distinguish it from open fMRI. One is, um, with open fMRI, you had to kind of send us your data, and then we had to do some stuff to it and put it online. With open neuro, using the bids project that I'm going to talk about, um, you can just sort of immediately upload your data and press a button, and it's shared uh, with that, not having to talk to us at all. <laughs> The second thing you can do is actually analyze the data. You can run a set of workflows on the data. So if you want to run FreeSurfer on your data, um, you can put it in and click the button, and it'll, it'll run FreeSurfer on it for you. Um, so you know, if, if I'm going to give you data, I need to, you, know, you need to be able to know kind of how to work with it. And that means you need to know all the metadata, both about the images, how they were collected, and about what was done in the experiment. Now, we had initially, in OpenFMRI, generated a kind of a framework for doing this, but then realized that that needed to be extended. So we worked with a large portion of the community. You can see all the, the authors. Uh, well, you can't see them because they're too tiny, but there's a lot of authors on the paper. Um, we basically worked with the community to develop a, a framework for describing an fMRI data set, or an imaging data set more generally. It could extend to... Uh, to uh, structural imaging, diffusion, and now there's actually extensions to other types of imaging as well. So it describes really two things. One is the how are files and folders named and organized, and then the second is how are the metadata organized, particularly you know, how are the files laid out that describe like what happened when during the study. <laughs> um, and if you were in the other uh, reproducible imaging session this morning, you saw a demo of the validator. So the idea is that we have a computational validator that can look at your data set before you even upload it and tell you whether it actually properly follows the standard. And if it doesn't, it'll tell you kind of what needs to be fixed in order to make it to follow the standard. Um, so if you go to Open Neuro, you can, you know, you'll get a dashboard that'll show your data sets. Um, and those can be either private or public. And um, as soon as you make them public, then in, they go on the public data sets page anybody out in the world can go grab them, download them, and also download any um, workflow. So if you run FreeSurfer on it, somebody can go grab your FreeSurfer outputs as well and work with those. Um, and so then, you know, if you are submitting your data to a journal that requires you to have shared your data, you can just give them the link to the, the DOI that points to the data set um, and put that in the paper. And that's a, you know, a permalink to the data set. Um, this is what a, an example, sorry, the text here is tiny. This is just to point out that people can go in and sort of look at the data, poke around on it, see that it was validated in terms of the bids format, and also see whatever analyses were run on it. Um, open fMRI data are, and, and open neuro data are accessible programmatically, both via, they, they sit on Amazon S3, so you can hit S3 directly to grab them. You can also use the Data Lad project, um, which is a really cool project by uh, Yara Kalchenko, Michael Hanka, that lets you basically, from the command line, grab full data sets. Um, I would definitely, if you're thinking about grabbing these data to actually work with them on your own machines, I would definitely recommend using Data Lad. It's a really nice uh, uh, project for sort of you know pulling down, and it goes well beyond Open Open fMRI, Open Neuro. He he indexes a lot of different data sets. Um, this, these are actually a year old, but we've seen you know, a lot of reuses of the OpenFMRI data sets. Um, we estimated last year that um, just the value of the data acquisition themselves is worth, uh, in terms of the reuse, is worth almost $3 million. That is, you know, we've saved people $3 million in data acquisition costs by giving out these data. Um, now, you, obviously, you know, you need to know things about what happened in the data. One, you want to know, you know, what happened when uh, during the task, but you'd also kind of like to know, you know, for, for all these data sets, what psychological functions do we think are actually being engaged when people do the thing that you're having them do? Um, and so we developed a project a few years ago called the Cognitive Atlas. It's meant to annotate this kind of information. So the idea is, you know, when people do a task, we want to know what are both, you know, what is the task, but also what do we think the psychological functions are that are being tapped by that task. So within the Cognitive Atlas, we distinguish between what we call mental concepts, which are the kind of the things in the head that we're trying to map onto the brain, and then the tasks that we actually use to study them. 
Um, and we try to sort of you know, establish the links between those to say for any particular measurement on a task, what do we think it's measuring, psycho what, what psychological functions do we think it's actually indexing? So you know, if you go to the database, you'll see, for example, if you're interested in working memory, you can go see that there's a page on working memory that defines it and then says you know, what, what are its relationships. So for example, you know, uh, there's different kinds of working memory, like phonological working memory and spatial working memory. And uh, working memory is a part of other things like decision making. Um, so we establish all these different relationships between different aspects of, uh, of those functions. And then we also list out what are all the tasks that we know about that are thought to measure working memory. And then we, you can also go look for any of those tasks. You can get a bunch of information about you know, what uh, what that task has been used for, what other types of things people think it might measure, and so on. Um, currently, the database, we just refreshed the, the back end of the database, um, and so it's actually much more flexible now. Um, it's got 800 or so mental constructs, 750-ish tasks. Um, we've now started fleshing it out in terms of what we call phenotypes, which could be disorders, they could be traits, like psychological traits, they could be behaviors, things like, uh, for example, you know, um, the Stroop effect is, a, is really a sort of a behavior that you can see on a task. Um, and it has a web API, so one could you know, sort of use that to, to grab information from it. So what we try to do is, for any data that we're sharing, actually annotate it using the Cognitive Atlas. So if you look at one of the database entries for data that are on NeuroVault, you'll see a link there um, to uh, the particular contrast that was measured um, in the task linked out to Cognitive Atlas. So if you want to know more about what was actually done in the task, you can follow that link and go to the Cognitive Atlas. Um, and so the, the goal here is really to have all of these different tools working together, right? And in some sense, the Cognitive Atlas is the, the one thing that might hold them all together because it's mapping the tasks that are being used and the psychological functions that we think we're trying to study. And ultimately, the goal is to be able to, you know, we, we don't really care. Tasks are kind of a tool that we use to, to kind of, you know, move the brain around. We don't care so much about tasks. We care about psychological functions. Um, and so the goal is to basically use you know, all of these, the knowledge that we have about the relationship between tasks and functions and all the data that we have where we know, you know what task is being done to basically start to do what we might think of as ontology-enabled meta-analysis. So to ask, you know, what particular, it doesn't help you for me to point at that, what particular psychological functions are associated with particular brain regions? Um, so I hope I've convinced you that uh, everybody benefits when we share things in a radically open way, um, and that you know if we, uh, you should always you know license your data in as minimal, uh, minimally restricted way as possible, um, and think about providing programmatic access or using tools that provide programmatic access, and hope that the ultimate goal is to basically allow us to do kind of automated, fully automated end to end. Um, meta-analysis that will let us map, you know, directly from lots of brain data back to psychological function. So I'll stop there and just thank all the folks who worked on this, particularly uh, Chris Gardalewski and, and Tal. So thank you.